Hello and welcome to Show Studio. Uh, my name is Jamie McRae. Uh, I'm the junior editor at Fantastic Man magazine, uh, and I'll be chairing this discussion on Grace Wells Bonner, uh, Grace Wells Bonner's Spring Summer 23 show, uh, which happened on Tuesday uh, at Pitti Uomo in Florence. Uh, I'm joined by this lovely panel, who I will allow to introduce themselves, uh, starting from TJ on the left. Hello, I'm TJ, junior editor at The Face magazine, um, mostly covering fashion, pop culture, nightlife, sometimes even football, would you believe? <laughs> Hi, I'm Joshua Graham. I'm a writer and the editorial assistant here at Show Studio. Hi, I'm Wilson Ariyama. I'm an artist and a writer, and I do extensive work in sustainable fashion and actually uh, a long time feature in uh, Grace's shows, actually. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, to kick off, uh, I th before we jump into the collection itself, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the medium of doing a show. Um, this is Grace's first show and first kind of real world presence in the last two years. Obviously, there was a small matter of a pandemic in between. Um, and I thought that she was one of the designers who really suited the video of um, digital shows or presentations or just the video format um, when shows weren't able to happen in real life. Um, do you think there's still a place for that now that shows are possible and have returned in a big way? I, I do, yeah, I do. I definitely think there's still a, still a place for, the, uh, for digital shows to happen. Um, I think it's, I think, you know, I think we can look at it in two ways, where the pandemic was, you know, devastating for designers when they're being stripped of uh, a huge aspect of, uh, of what they do, you know, so much of it relies on, like, real life, uh, the whole show aspect. Um, but saying that, I think, you know, for younger emerging designers, that sort of digital platform enables them to still put their work out, but they're not, you, you know, it's, it's more cost effective. Um, it's, you know, it's also, if you think about being sustainable, um, there's that too, which, you know, it's not a bad thing. Um, but I was, you know, of course, I think like most people, I'm, you know, very happy now that real life shows are starting again. Um, and like you said, I think, you know, Grace is one of those designers um, where the digital platform did suit her very well. Um, you know, she's always collaborating with such, you know, such interesting photographers who really, you know, sort of tell the story of her work beautifully, but at the same time, I think her work is so steeped in like, you know, research and sort of immersive experiences, be it an exhibition or be it a real life show. Um, and I mean, yeah, this, this, this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just, I wanted to talk about, I think Grace has done really well with kind of the digital format and creating these really beautiful videos as like, as love letters for her collection. But I think there is such a, um, such a power in the actual physical presentation of this show and the collaboration with um, Ibrahim Ma Mahama. Mahama. And the way he created the set um, really forces an audience to kind of not just witness it, but really interact with it in a way that I think sometimes gets lost in the digital format. Definitely. And I think, um, you know, she's just released a video for the um, Adidas collection last week, I think. Um, so I feel like it's still very much a part of her process and the ways in which she can reach people. Um, I feel like it's always been a part of her process, mm -hmm. like TJ touched on from early on, whether it was the images or the yeah. references that she was featured in the, in the uh, notes of her show, or even the collaborations from different photographers and, and filmmakers like Harley Weir or whoever. There's, it's always been a, uh, a, a held a strong presence mm -hmm. in her uh, in her art form, yeah. as well as the garments, it's also the visuals and, and where she takes people to. I feel like uh, she has a great depth and curiosity mm -hmm. about who, as well as who she is as a designer, but also this uh, world that she wants to create that yeah. is represented in her clothes and has evolved mm -hmm. over seasons. Yeah, and it's something that uh, I'd like to touch on a bit later, is the collaborators, but you know, she's always managed to bring people in to whatever 
medium she's using. You know, as Josh said, uh, the artist Ibrahim Mahama um, working on the sets of the show, um, to then you know making magazines, making doing a show at the Serpentine. There's there's all these avenues in which she's managed to um, yeah bring so many people in. Um, and I think a video is a great way of continuing that, for example. Um, Wilson, you touched on the research and the notes, um, the, the kind of infamous Wales Bonner show notes, which are always, um, you know, three or four pages, um, usually come with a reading list uh, or a bibliography, which they didn't this season, uh, which I was a little, I just thought was, was somewhat kind of surprising. Um, as you mentioned, you and Grace are kind of long-term collaborators and friends. Um, I wondered if you could give us a bit of an insight into how a collection such as this one starts. Uh, I think it's in the same way that uh, you, well, I haven't worked with Grace in that context in a while, even though we're, we're good friends, I've kind of shifted away from uh, that context of work, let's say. so. Um, but when, from when I used to work with her, and even as I see it, it's, it's still this uh, curiosity about, um, about where, like finding different, uh, let's say, tribes of, 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 or communities of people around the world that align with this uh, narrative that she's weaving together and trying to um, bring it forth in a way that uh, maybe history hasn't given an opportunity mm -hmm. for them to do so. So I feel like there's, there's many, she's a very curious person and, and it shows in her work as, as it evolves and it has, while there's things that stay the same, there's things that are always constantly changing yeah. in very positive ways. So I, it, it starts from uh, poems, ideas, videos, and all of the mm -hmm. stuff that may appear in the show notes and then kind of builds from there. Yeah, and uh, it was definitely a theme of this collection, she references uh, Sankofa, which is a kind of Ghanaian symbol and um, I guess kind of almost motto, which is about the idea of going backwards to, looking backwards to go forwards. And I think that she has historically been very, very good at drawing attention, as you said, to things, uh, texts, artworks, uh, people, um, rhythmic sounds um, that have not necessarily been given their proper dues in uh, terms of wider, you know, modern culture, um, which is certainly interesting to see um, today. Um, and you can see that very much in the um, use of the space that um, the show was in on Tuesday. Um, it was a um, old uh, palazzo, the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, um, which was home to Alessandro Medici, um, who's widely believed to be the first black uh, modern Western head of, head of state, um, which is in of itself a very symbolic uh, arena to do a show like this. Um, and then when you add in the, so for context, the Medicis were um, a very, very wealthy family of bankers in Florence um, who were patrons of the arts, um, but, you know, white patrons of the arts. And to take um, that context and then, you know, move it forwards to having a very um, historically important uh, black figure uh, live in this palazzo. Uh, and then to take uh, today, uh, or on Tuesday, an artist um, from Ghana uh, and cover it in jute sacks, which are used to ship uh, cocoa around the world in. Um, there are so many layers of, uh, of meaning within that, um, which is very interesting. Um, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think what, while Grace's work is, you know, is, it's so informed by history, and I think it could be quite easy to sort of fall into a sort of nostalgic trap but I think what Grace does so sort of impeccably well is that each season, you know, while she is taking these sort of, you know, 60s, 70s, you know, 80s references, that, that it feels so contemporary, you know? And I think that it, it aligns with politics at the moment, you know? I think, uh, you know, black and brown people are very much sort of fighting for our stories to be, hold, you know, to be told in, in, in ways that they haven't been before, um, be it through, you know, bigger platforms or, 
just sort of having the opportunity now to tell those stories. And I think that's what, I mean, that's what I always see with Grace's work, you know, she's sort of breathing new life into, into these like, ex, you know, incredible stories that, that, uh, that she sort of uncovers. Yeah. Her research, I mean, her, her research is, you know, it's just insane. It's so, it's so heavy. Um, mm. And like, you know, Wilson mentioned, uh, recently mentioned that, you know, she's curious. Yeah. And I think that's something that you see each season with, you know, with, uh, in Wells Bonnet, it's that curiosity. Yeah. Definitely. Each look is like so, it's so well thought, mm -hmm. um, you know, from like the stitch to the way that, you know, the sort of jeans like hang off the trouser. Um, kind of going back to the um, location of the show, it almost felt like the collection and it almost felt like a site specific um, collection, which I thought was very interesting. Obviously, um, designers have a vision in mind when they start designing a collection, but this tied together so well with the, um, with the clothing, there's a kind of opulence and um, beauty to the tailoring that fits very well with doing a show in Florence, um, but also just, um, yeah, all these kind of strands of history that she, um, you know, puts, literally puts into the threads of her clothing, also ran through this um, palazzo. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, no, I, I thought it, it, was, it was a very good choice of space that you don't sometimes see in, uh, in everyone's choice of location. You know, obviously there are boring things like budgetary constraints and stuff like that. <laughs> and um, she was supported, I think, by the Italian uh, Fashion Council and, and Pitti. Um, whatever, let's, let's not talk about that. But um, <laughs> what, what would you like to see designers do in terms of um, putting more importance on the history or you know, context of a venue? Well, so no, 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 I've banged on enough. Well, I think <laughs> specifically with the venue that Grace used and the way that Ibrahim um, did the set, it was really impactful in how it recontextualized um, kind of unheard voices or, or histories or craft that maybe is a footnote in textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, and then presenting in a collection these um, like macrame dresses and these um, like wool skirts that I believe is referencing um, the Akan people of Ghana. And it's bringing it, it's positioning it, I think, in, in the world of Florence mm -hmm. that's um, so known for European, Italian craft. And it's putting them really mm. on the same level. Definitely. TJ, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, you know, I think the best kind of designers are ones who really sort of nail the, the show space, you know, mm -hmm. like a similar, um, well, you know, Martin Rose's show on Sunday, that was, you know, for me, it was so sort of seeped in like sort of sexy, homoerotic, you know, it, it was in an old disused sauna in Vauxhall. And I think that sort of all encompassing really takes the collection up a notch. And I think, you know, Grace, I can't, I can't remember what season it was, but uh, the collection that she showed in Chelsea, it was, it was sort of like a ballroom kind of thing, and it just had tables, so it looked like a, uh, it looked like a sort of family wedding type of thing, and then it had a buffet in the corner, um, you know, with like a traditional sort of Jamaican food, and that was like, it was so beautiful, yeah. you know, and I think that like, that sort of all-encompassing designer when they can sort of strike a chord with like the collection, the location and everything. I think that's what sort of elevates. And it also makes it really memorable, you know? Mm. Yeah, it, it shows this, uh, uh, this like multi-dimensional sensory, um, not to throw words together, but this understanding of, of uh, different layers of, of existence and, and how we and how things come together because in the same way that we're speaking greatly about the the set and the location that also informs say uh, the models and mm. and the team as well in mm -hmm. how to to feel because grace is very um as you've mentioned she will take her audience to many various locations whether through videos or, or through the actual shows as well and this this evokes uh, as being on that side of uh, it always evokes a feeling in you mm. to, to kind of play 
uh, the role that's been kind of crafted by the space that you're in, the clothes that uh, you're representing, and, and the stories that are being told as well through, through the notes as well. So I feel like she um, pulls it together um, in a really interesting way, like we yeah. also mentioned. I no, think I, it goes back sorry. really to what you said earlier about Grace being so masterful at world building mm -hmm. and um, having a hand in every detail that goes behind her brand and building something that's so deeply personal that I think it really evokes a response from yeah. the audience. Yeah. It's a show that um, I think uh, would you know, stick in the mind just from, a, as, as you said, Wilson, multi-sensory approach, like those sacks will smell and you can you know, write up close, see the texture, see the kind of history running through them. Um, which is something that you do miss from a digital um, thing is, uh, is, you know, obviously we're very lucky to be able to attend shows in, in real life. Um, so one thing that a digital thing does do is bring that to everyone, bring it into people's homes, not just the, um, you know, hundred or so magazine editors that get to um, go to these things. Absolutely, um, because even uh, one thing which is uh, as a result of the pandemic is being sped up quite quickly is this uh, the advent of digital fashion because mm. most even though you see all of these brands with hundreds of thousands or millions of followers most uh, followers of a brand have never been to uh, the brand store they may have never even held the brand's garments mm -hmm. and for them it's a very uh, 2d experience it's quite flat so so it's um, like as a baby growing up, you, you have to, or you, as part of the development, they have to interact and play mm. with their surroundings. But for a lot of people with the brands that they love and like, they don't know what it smells like or, mm. or what it feels like to walk into a store or to be within the show. And that's, um, I meant to mention it earlier, but that's also why I feel like, whoa, this uh, digital representation of fashion will only uh, become more ever present as, mm. as the tools and technology allow for new ways of consumers to interact with mm -hmm. their favorite brands and vice versa. Definitely, I think it, you know, it can only be a good thing to have uh, more people included within the fashion system because it is you know, pretty exclusionary uh, if we're being you know, totally honest. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, cool. Um, back to Ibrahim Mahama, um, what do you see the role um, of an artist as a collaborator within fashion being today? Uh, it's becoming ever more popular, uh, Dior uh, <coughs> collaborate with uh, multiple artists each season, um, Peter Doig, Kenny Scharf recently, um, is it, uh, yeah, what do you think about it? I think with when thinking about Walls Bonner and, and Grace as a designer, we talked about how well researched she was and how really in depth she goes with constructing these narratives. And that really extends to the artist she chooses to collaborate with um, because it feels like a really deeply personal extension of what she's trying to say. Um, and for me, it leaves me pessimistic anytime a brand kind of slaps an artist's logo on a t-shirt and calls that a collaboration. Yeah. Yes. TJ? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you take, for example, Supreme, they've done, you know, sort of artist collaborations. I think it, it really just sort of depends on if it feels right for the brand, if it, if it fits in with some sort of aesthetic. Obviously, when, you know, when Mel's Bonner does it, it's, it's sort of done from such a it's so it, you know it's so thoughtful it's sort of like you know within her realm and it really makes sense for the collection um i, I don't know I, I, I quite like an artist artist collaboration you're allowed you're allowed to thank you <laughs> um, yeah i do i think it's nice you know yeah. it's nice like you know bringing those two worlds together yeah. um so long as you know it doesn't feel contrived mm -hmm. i think that's when it gets a bit tiring doesn't it yes if, it, if it's for the sake of it um who wants to see that? <laughs> um, and kind of taking Grace's uh, collaborative spirit further and maybe drilling down a little while, sorry, on, on screen now, we've got a Kerry James Marshall um, artwork turned into a t-shirt, which is, um, I think makes sense, makes total sense in the context of 
Grace's canon of work and in the context of this, this collection in particular. Um, and going onwards with her this kind of spirit of collaboration into the clothes, there's lots of um, collaborations uh, within this collection, um, ranging from um, using hand-dyed uh, jerseys from artisans in Burkina Faso, which is, you know, one level to the big behemoth that is Adidas, uh, to using Chave for shirting, to using Savile Row, Taylor, Anderson, Shepard for um, coats and tuxedos and all of that. There are so many layers um, within that, which is so, I think, almost refreshing to, to see that, um, you know, a designer realize what kind of expertise and um, craft can really be and translate that into um, something that's still very uh, on brand. Yeah, I think it's a wider um, trend of, let's say, the maturation of fashion mm -hmm. in that, uh, as we all know, like decades past, it's, it's very been, uh, the world of high-end fashion has been like hush-hush behind closed doors and very rarely even sharing any little tidbit mm. of your of your process or what you know or what you've worked on until it's a show and even then it's still quite reserved so i feel like in the last decade or so we're really seeing um this turning point where as well as probably because of the internet and stuff where it's okay to to share your ideas and to uh like tell people also because of the requirements of uh brands to, to also be like oh you need to be present in this way it's, mm. it's kind of forcing uh, brands and, and but of course this is something that's naturally been present in our work from the start but uh, for a lot of legacy brands it's been this kind of forcing to ad adapt and it's like okay now we have to really have conversations with these people as opposed to like um, maybe just put them on the end or or reference in a, their work in a way that, but not credit them mm -hmm. so I feel like it's a it's a growing trend that's mm -hmm. that's happening also because of this maturation let's mm -hmm. say yeah um, yeah, and I think that it kind of, uh, Grace is very good at laying a uh, new template, if you will, for what kind of luxury fashion can be in the sense that, um, yeah, a return to uh, craft and expertise and not necessarily chasing uh, a new customer or a cool customer or, or you know, a different... Um, a, a, a trying to attract someone else's pool of people, it, it has to um, it has to make sense. Yeah, I, also, I agree. I think she's like very comfortable with in knowing who her wearer is, mm -hmm. and who like you know who the sort of Wales Bonner man or woman is. You know, she really understands those people. She understands what they want. And I also oh, sorry, 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 no, no, no. Uh, I think <laughs> she takes care of that. Person yeah. as well through um, you know everything we've spoken about through inclusivity and um, uh, working with you know lots of people but also through the clothes themselves they look good on people um, and I think they're designed to do that as well as carrying all of you know this deeper meaning the clothes look good um, which is also something that's often forgotten about um, and they look comfortable I mean we're flicking through the um, the most recent collection, and you would wear all of it um, and feel good in it, and uh, it will make you look good, but also feel good, which I think um, kind of comes from a place of warmth and tenderness, and um, yeah, and, and not from necessarily a really commercial angle either. Yeah, and also be able to like, I'm not sure about, I'm sure it's the same for, for everyone here. It's like anytime you really want to decide like, oh, this year I want to look like a mix of A, B, and C, where A might be a particular person, B might be a, a time or a place, and C might be some type of smell or a food or, or even a slogan or whatever. And it's, it's that, uh, this feeling that you can live in those clothes, I feel like that, that's shown very present mm. in, in her work. Like, oh, I could imagine myself uh, in, this in these types of contexts, or this would be me at my, I don't know, but essentially yeah. it, it can, you can really live, like you said, live in the clothes. No, definitely. 
Um, I I'm thought sure. what was um, actually really interesting about this collection was um, I thought it, was, it felt a lot more approachable, I think, and a real kind of shift in where Grace wants to position her brand. Um, and you see that really with how seamless the, the sportswear elements mm. here um, exist next to her really regal signature tailoring. And I think that's really, really cool. No, definitely. And, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of, uh, that comes from uh, this Adidas collaboration, which we keep talking about. But even that is taken to um, the extreme of you know, the shoes in uh, the latest show. Um, were handmade, the handmade Adidas shoes, which is just a level of... Um, the red ones? I think all of them, maybe. Yeah, the oh, ones are def I think so the good. ones are, uh, for sure. Um, and they're made in um, an atelier in Germany by the Adidas team with the same care that goes into um, you know, a, a handmade pair of whatever brogues um, that you buy from somewhere else. Um, and I think it does just kind of speak to that... Um, Care for the customer. Considers uh, exactly. Really, like, yeah. Considers her customer. She considers the product she's putting out. Um, I think a lot of brands will kind of put out a collab like that as as such a a saleable piece of a collection that almost feels like a preview for the web page that's going to be up in two months' time. And I don't really feel that here. It, it feels so intrinsic to yeah. what she's saying. So the thing as well, like when you wear. Uh, Adidas Wells Bonner, you feel like you're wearing Wells Bonner, you know, like you feel like you're wearing something from from, from the from a, you know, from a season collection. Yeah, it's it's just it's made so well, like the way it's like you know I, I love a track top, like an Adidas track top, full zip or whatever, and you know the way that it sort of sits on the neck and you know the the sort of fabric, uh, the fabrics that they use, um, and I think you know that sort that collaboration. I mean, I hope it carries on for a really, really long time yeah. because I think it makes perfect sense. And as well, it's, you know, it's allowing the customer who loves Wells Bonner, but, you know, can't, it's expensive. It's yeah. really, you know, it's a, it's a very expensive brand. Um, but it's allowing, you know, those customers who can't afford that to sort of still feel like they're able, yeah, able to wear it. Definitely. Yeah, and I feel like it's, it expands on this idea of world building in that. She's, she's only like almost a decade in, let's say, and there's still, and she might have only shown us one continent of the, the world that she's building, and, and maybe this collaboration with Adidas allows for another part of the world to show up. So I feel like, yeah, it's uh, this ongoing telling of her story, like you also mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, she obviously started doing uh, uh, just uh, menswear. Um, uh, but it was um, immediately adopted by a whole kind of uh, group of women because it was just, uh, uh, yeah, so considered and um, nice, for want of a better word. <laughs> um, and now has obviously branched out into um, more kind of explicitly um, women's wear looks, such as Look 9, which we, are, we have on our screen. Um, do you think that is necessary for a designer today to make that distinction? Lots of designers choose not to. Um, what do you think the motivation behind that is, as in choosing to um, delineate it a little bit more clearly? What is in like designers doing explicitly men's and women's wear? Yeah, and I think um, women will buy the men's wear looks, uh, men will buy the women's wear looks in this collection, for example. Yeah, totally. Um, but going from a place of kind of designing for men and being worn by women to now kind of splitting it a little bit more. Um, do you think that's a conscious decision for, for a start? I think it could be. I think there's, there's interest in also, um, not that I, 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 this is just conjecture, but mm -hmm. I think there's interest in uh, wanting to maybe stick somewhat to, to formalities, but also pull them in different directions yeah. in that the consumer of today isn't, even it's, it also allows for more uh, options or, or opportunities to uh, interface with the brand, let's say, because I'm, I might go into, like I don't think I've had like a men's, 
like I have a, quite a collection of like over the shoulder mm -hmm. bags and, and the majority of them are yeah. uh, designed for women. Yeah. But I like them because of the, maybe it might be the straps or the way that it comes together or, or mm -hmm. how it allows me to hold various items within the bags. But it's, it's not about um, thinking about, what, I think it's just more so somewhere to start from. And when you have a, a fixed start in place, that allows you uh, an, a number of, and and for number of possibilities, mm -hmm. and then also doing the same for maybe okay for this type of woman, for this type of man, for this uh, maybe uh, non-binary person, or different types of modes of starting points. Mm -hmm. Even though it might be similar, it allows you to pull pull yeah. from and take it in different yeah. directions completely. While they still might be similarities. Mm -hmm. um, everyone loves a good rumor uh, in the fashion industry. A rumor. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Juicy. Address that elephant in the room, Grace to Louis Vuitton, apparently. Yeah. Any thoughts? Pretty amazing. Any gossip? But like, he was also at uh, Martine on Saturday, wasn't he? I also he? heard that. Uh, yeah, yes. he, was, he was. He was front row. Okay. Well, please, I was not at the Martine Rose show, so. Uh, that's all I know. <laughs> um, I just saw him and I was like, oh, interesting. Do you, um, we think Grace Wells Bonnet is going to Louis Vuitton? I hope not. It's um, very, please, why? I think when we think about like Grace as a designer, she again she's so researched and considered, and there's almost a slow pace at um, at the level that she works at, mm -hmm. in again world building and creating something so thought provoking. And when we look at the work that Virgil did at Louis Vuitton Men's and and Kim Jones before him, I think they were so masterful at at creating like really intense digital moments, like leaving the customer, especially on like social media, to kind of want to refresh for more for, for the latest bag or the latest trainer or um, the latest celebrity just wearing the collection. And I, I, if you, yeah, thinking of just like how, how Grace seems to work with her own brand is that necessarily the biggest or the right fit for, mm -hmm. for Louis Vuitton and for Grace? Um, and I don't think that LVMH would at all be interested in kind of slowing down mm. a moneymaker like Louis Vuitton. Wilson? Um, that, that room was news to me, so I'm not in oh, okay. <laughs> fashion as, uh, or, no, fair or not this, this side of fashion yeah, yeah. as extensively, but um, I, I think what comes to mind is the why. Uh, too often, not just in fashion, just because something is, uh, it's this idea of, oh, we have to follow this uh, set, uh, already set up uh, set of steps, like, oh, you have to go to uh, a bigger brand, or you have to go to this house, or under this uh, conglomerate, or, or whoever. And, yeah. and, and my question is, uh, uh, why? Or if I, if I was to say, I would want to know why would she go there and what was the reasoning outside mm -hmm. of just this need to um, grow endlessly, mm. which uh, in, well, we can look at other parts of society in this, and we just see this like desire to grow endlessly without direction uh, has had a negative impact. So I will, but that's also to say, even if she, if that does happen, that can uh, result in a beautiful collaboration and it can go many ways, it's just more so what's the, the reasoning behind it. Could be interesting, but who knows? Yeah, watch this space. Um, I think that idea of um, growing endlessly also really is in direct opposition of kind of the work that Ibrahim um, presented mm. at this collection when you think about um, like so, social hierarchies and um, who ends up getting pushed to the side and who and ends up growing mm -hmm. and yeah, does, does Grace need to grow with an already established French house? It's a very good question, and it brings up another one uh, that I will try and phrase. Uh, is Grace, is Wales Bonnet a big brand, basically? Define big. Well, that's the question, uh, essentially. Is, you know, because she's been around for uh, a long time and, and you know, very rightly is held up as this paragon of um, the British fashion industry and, and what a brand and a person can become um, through, um, you know, not necessarily having to go and show elsewhere, came through, um, yeah, came through London. Um, 
has she reached a point and has the brand reached the point where it needs to go somewhere else? Um, and will this, you know, showing outside of London? Yeah, I don't think yet. I think, you know, I, th- I think Grace, like, she moves at a very, like, you know, very quiet sort of, sort of pace. And I think that's why it's, you know, each show feels so sort of, um, I don't know, so, so sort of ceremonial, so yeah. special, um, almost like religious, you know? And I think, you know, a big bang like Louis Vuitton, maybe not yet, I don't know. It would be, I mean, it would be cool though, wouldn't it? Look pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the collaborating with Adidas is a really interesting move for, for Grace and for her brand? Because it does position her um, within kind of a really big mainstream brand that everyone yeah. is familiar with. And, I think that's the kind of step that really shows a progression with with her own personal brand growth. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, um, as we've discussed, the uh, Adidas collaboration makes a lot of sense and it's really good. But um, I feel like uh, designers, once they reach a certain point, have to start taking on these collaborations um, that aren't necessarily so good to just to take them to that. Um, next level before inevitably the big house comes calling and that seems like an established what has been an established route up until this point is that are we at the end of that point well, i was going to uh, say like you know for like is that is that the goal for designers like well, you know yeah, start yeah. Up, like, I, I don't know you know but it's like if is is that the goal because you know this is such a successful brand on its own um not even talking about you know sort of revenue and money yeah. and all that yeah. stuff, but like people genuinely love it because she delivers each season. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, same as Martine and uh, various other brands. But as a designer, you know, even if you are starting up your own brand and you're getting like critically acclaimed and you know you've got loads of fans and people down the street are wearing your top, um, is it still your goal to then? Are you still waiting yeah. for that big moment? I mean, yeah. I guess you know money's good, and if you're if you're being offered like a fat salary, it's going to be hard to say no. But I don't know. It's yeah, it's quite weird for me. Like, I think we're also maybe assuming that she hasn't been asked by a big brand yet. True. I yes, mean, course. she there might be a billion reasons why she isn't at a big brand now. I'm yeah. thinking specifically about um, her friend and collaborator Maximilian, who was still showing at Fashion East yes. and got that Ferragamo job. Yeah. Um, and that's like so quick since he started um, mm-hmm. showing his own label. So yeah, I, I don't think it's maybe far-fetched to think that Grace doesn't want to or the right opportunity hasn't maybe come up. And I think, well, one thing that isn't uh, immediately visible to most people who are outside of fashion is that a lot of times as you evolve in your, in your spaces like a fashion designer, there's a lot of um, opportunities for consulting or, mm-hmm. or um, behind the scenes uh, creative direction yeah. that uh, designers will do for other brands in, in diff- completely different mm-hmm. contexts as well that, are, that occurs that isn't visible to most people. So I think Grace has a, a, a clear understanding of where things are and how um, how she wants to move forward. And yeah. again, it comes back to this point that you mentioned in that um, we are like at this great shift mm-hmm. in, in terms of, even though the foot uh, steps are there but by like the, the designers of, of times past, but it's, there's a veering off of going into a different direction and that not everyone needs to go to, like you can look at Samuel Ross, for example, mm. and what he's done with a cold war, it's that, um, you can create your own uh, community in the same, same way with Grace has created your own community, your own narrative and your own uh, world and allow for it to grow in, a, in, a, in, in the way that you want to. You don't need to follow the, the path that's set out. Like Grace, I don't think, um, even if you look at all of her shows and, and uh, references and, and videos and, and, and films and stuff, it's, she always takes you to new places and, and I don't think I, I don't think that's like at the top of her list that, oh, she has to go mm-hmm. directly to, uh, I don't know, whatever uh, yeah. big uh, conglomerate you, you can think of. I think it's just more like, this is, this is my own journey and I'm building my 
own world in a very considered way and I want it to go in in that every collaboration we've seen with her has always been quite care, carefully thought out and, and considered especially you see with the Adidas stuff it's very it's, it's as, as TJ mentioned it's very grace in, in its nature and, yeah. and it just feels like Wells Bonner to its uh, to, to the touch to the fabric and, and I don't I feel like she's she's on her own path and isn't yeah. uh, so fixated on on the narratives that have been impressioned on like uh, young fashion designers for so long that you mm -hmm. have to go this step and then you have to go to this place and to this place and then that's how you make it and, it's, yeah. and I okay. think yeah you pick your own path. Yeah, I think that's what really sets her apart as well. So she moves at her own pace and she doesn't really. You know, it almost feels like she doesn't care about yeah. what's going on around her. She doesn't care about trends or like, you know, anything like that or showing on season. Or and why should she? And why should she? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that I think, yeah, that that's what kind of almost almost gives her like a, a, a sense of like mystery. You know. Oh yeah, very much so. And that's great. That's so, great. Yeah. That's what we love. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Even the fact that she only does uh, two collections a year, plus you know whatever's going on. That's all we need. Uh, yeah. Like it's literally yeah. all we need. Like, um, and from a <laughs> sustainable perspective as well, there's not um, <coughs> the sense that there's not uh, you know the wastage of these big uh, big conglomerates. That when you can be when you're smaller, you can be more agile. You can be more nimble. You can you know uh, live within. The framework that you set for yourself, rather than the framework that's being set for you by the market, essentially. Yeah. And it's probably great for the mind. I, I doubt, mm. I doubt creating like eight, eight shows or eight collections a year has any positive impact on no. your well-being so, or even your creative it's just process. Bonkers, isn't it? Like, what, what is the need? Yeah. You know. And I think, especially for someone like her, if you are doing that you then lose all of the other stuff, the stuff that we've touched upon, you know, the video, the, um, the magazine making, the uh, exhibitions, the, you know, sound baths with Laraji, the, you know, all of this stuff um, that is so impressive and creates um, this mythology around, around the brand and will ultimately, I think, be, um, not what she's remembered for, because uh, obviously the clothes are very important too. But you know they're all, they're, they're so interlinked. Um, all of these other things with the actual reality of being, you know, a fashion designer, which is making clothes. Um, yeah. Um, sustainability is a very kind of hot topic um, at really? the moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean. We are sitting in a sweltering London thing. <laughs> Anyone that thinks climate change is not happening is uh, just needs to step outside. Um, to what extent do you think um, brands and designers have uh, responsibility to put it at the forefront of their collections? Massive. They they literally don't have a choice now. Yeah. It's, you know, you can see straight. You know, you could just. It's. It's in plain sight. <laughs> the world is fucked. <laughs> and, you know, you, you, all you have to do is just, you know, type in fashion waste on mm. Google and the mountains and mountains of clothes. And the thing is, you know, I think the argument with sustainability, rightfully so, a lot of the time it is about fast fashion, but it's not just fast fashion. And, like, we need to stop blaming, you know, people who are buying that and think about the wider perspective. Mm. You know, stop! Stop blaming! Stop blaming like the people down there, and blame the big. You know, blame the big people. They're the ones who are like churning out so much, so much. Like, do we not have enough already? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, I don't. So as as uh, well, I've done a lot of stuff in sustainability and fashion for like maybe five, six years yeah. now, from like documentaries about toxic chemicals in fashion. Uh, talks in various locations, conferences, a lot of writing, uh, a lot of consulting, and, and just worked with like different organizations across all levels of fashion with regards to sustainability. And this, well, this could be its own uh, yeah. show studio <laughs> conversation in itself, but I, I think one thing is that um, it's very difficult to 
frame sustainability in an easy way for consumers mm -hmm. because uh, the way, also probably because of how uh, the impact of, say, uh, the climate terror documentaries or, or the panic-inducing mm -hmm. documentaries has kind of just steered us in a particular way, there's only most consumers will think about uh, what sustainability is one-dimensionally when it's, it becomes all of these different things like uh, your garments and where they're sourced, how they're, they're transported, how the, what type of uh, conditioning or chemicals do you use in the fabrics, and what's the ecology like for the people who are producing these materials, how long does it sit within these spaces, what are the long-term effects of wearing these garments, and, all, and then it, it can extend into all of these different ways, and what I'm trying to say is essentially um, most 99.9999, however far you want to go, percent of consumers won't care to understand anything beyond the base layer of this is sustainable. So mm -hmm. while all brands do need to take on sustainability within their um, inner workings, and, and a lot is being done with regards to uh, digital IDs, the supply chain mm -hmm. management has become a lot more transparent than it has before. Even in, say, let's say in two or three years, every single brand will have a digital ID on the, on the label, and it might show you where, um, where who's made it, where it's been uh, sold from, uh, the different types of materials and, and uh, processes it's been through, and also potentially how to recycle it, how to, who, where you can recycle it, and all different types of information. And then maybe a bit later, there may be a commerce layer applied to that, but mm -hmm. the, the idea is that at its core, fashion is, is being forced to innovate on the supply chain and uh, production side mm -hmm. very rapidly. And, it, and it's coming to a head, it's just more so, um, there's a, a disconnect in terms of what what people think sustainability is, what what it actually is, um, how some brands present that narrative to people, mm -hmm. and because a lot of brands you will speak to them and they're very uh, scared about even being honest about, oh hey, yeah. we're just getting out on our journey, but I'm going on, so yeah. sorry, please go on. No, 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 I'm, uh, no, carry on. Uh, I'm agreeing with you. Um, let's wrap up with one final question. Um, going back to the concept of uh, Sankofa, which was a big part of the collection and the show, this idea of um, going backwards to look forwards. Um, how important is that within the context of kind of contemporary fashion today, uh, that this mining of archives and history and knowing where we came from to um, take us into a better future? Anyone. I think it's really important. Yeah, I think it is. I think the whole like looking back to look forward. It's good to know. It's good to know your history. Um, it's very important as well to know your history because um, it informs your if it, you know it informs your next steps. It informs like the way you think, um, and also gives you you know sort of gives you a bit of bit of fight, you know. And that, that's, that's not a bad thing. I think, you know, designers at the moment are, like, a, are so nostalgic, you know? Mm -hmm. It's all you see on the cut was just, like, nostalgia, whether it's, like, 90s or whatever. Um, but I think when it's done in this way, and it's, you know, I think the context of it... Because um, I think Grace actually said... I, re I, read, I think it was on Vogue or something, but I think Grace said this isn't nostalgia. It mm -hmm. is, as you said, looking back to look forward. And it's true, you know, you know she's using that sort of historical context to give her some sort of grounding right now. And that's, that's nice. Don't know if I articulated that very well. <laughs> Josh? Um, very hot. <laughs> uh, I think with this collection and with what Grace does so, I think beautifully, is um, giving voice to maybe cultures or people or techniques or these references, um, new light and a new audience. And when it comes to looking back to look forward, it's about not leaving things behind or not leaving things in the past and giving equal weight to um, these things that she's discovered or that she's researched that she finds equally important. Anything to add, Wilson? Yeah, um, just to add on to what you said as well, I think um, Race does this uh, thing particularly really well, which is that it's the idea that um, for marginalized communities or, or telling of stories that uh, retaliation in 
in kind isn't the only way of taking action. And it's, it's, she's created uh, her own pathway in her own world, and she, I think she does that well and shows people that you can tell these stories and it doesn't have to be uh, an, a footnote on, on another group's story or in response. It's just like these exist within their own place and that's how you immerse yourself. And then as well, to, to go back to your Sankofa, um, well, it just reminds me of that uh, common uh, quote, where is it? Uh, those who uh, don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Mm. So. Yeah, very much so. Cool. Well, thank you very much for uh, being here. TJ thank Josh you. Wilson. Awesome. Thank you. You for watching us. Um, that was Grace Wells Bronner, Spring Summer 23. Uh, hopefully in a nutshell for you. <laughs> See you soon.